Yeah, that's, uh, thanks for that. We also think of everyone around the world. We're aware of the fact that Rob had so many friends everywhere. And everyone who is tuning in today, whether you were a friend of Rob's, a colleague, whether you were a Dharma brother or sister, a teacher, or some kind of other associate or friend or connection, all these connections make up the tapestry of Rob's life. And everyone is part of this mandala today. So thank you for being here. So having said that, I was feeling so confident this morning when I did the mic test. And now I'm like, the mic is not at the right heights. My voice is wobbling. I've got to stand wide legged because there are wires underneath. I'll, I'll settle in. I'll settle in in a moment. Thank you. So my name is Izel. And um, I think in the 30 years I knew Rob, maybe he called me Izel once. Maybe that was the day that I met him at the Center for Spirituality in Seapoint. I don't know who of you remember that wonderful place that Sylvia Katz used to run. Yeah, we used to go there on Wednesdays and listen to all kinds of people talking about all, the, all kinds of amazing things. And that was the first time I clapped eyes on Rob. And I remember sitting in the audience and being really touched by what he was sharing and of course his brilliance and his eloquence and the way he could articulate things and I think I asked him a really um, cheeky question in fact I remember I asked him a really cheeky question which you can find out for me after the service <laughs> those of you who want to know the details um, but it was very shortly after that a year later that I joined the center and a few years later that I took refuge with Upper Rinpoche, and a few years later that I moved into the center, and a few years later that we founded the Bardo Group with Rob's great support. So, yes, he called me Izel maybe once. The rest of the time he referred to me as Scutty, which does not give anyone here permission to call me Scutty. I'm just saying that for the record. Um, and it's a, it's a term of endearment in my mother tongue, Afrikaans, which for those of you who don't know, is the third most spoken language out of the 12 official languages in South Africa. We have just joined our 12th um, official language as sign language, um, which is wonderful. And Skati means a diminutive treasure. And that was me and Rob. We used to speak Mingles, Minglish, with each other, a mixture of English and Afrikaans. And he truly was the only Dharma teacher I've ever had who had the capability and the willingness to extend himself to communicate with me in my mother tongue. So the last time I was with Rob, I was also with Sandra, one of the co-founders of the Bardo Group with Margaret and with Wesley, Rob's wonderful carer, who's here today with his wife, welcome. And again, even though he was very frail and he was lying down, conserving his energy, he was so alive and so bright and thoughtful and kind and present and just himself. And we were talking in Mengos, in Minglish again, me Afrikaans, and he was answering me in Afrikaans, and we had this little repartee. And at one point, I said to him, Rob, what's your Shona like nowadays? And without skipping much of a beat, he answered me immediately and quite substantially in Shona, not just one or two words. So I mention all this because, to me, that is the heart of Rob. And it is such a powerful symbol of the fact that he was a true son of the African soil. And it is no surprise that he brought the African Tibetan Lama Akarimbache to our shores. It's also no surprise that his memorial is the day before Akarimbache's commemoration day. Coincidence? Hmm. And yeah, 
what else can one say about that? One of my Dharma sisters in the week said that the reach of what Rob and Akarambache, but the Lifter Machik, but this that in Engels help my Cecil, what they achieved, thank you, uh, throughout the continent and also Akarambache throughout Asia and particularly yeah. Tibet, is borders on the mystical because it's so unfathomable to wrap our heads around how it was even possible. With that, let me make space for other voices. And I'd like to say that we did our best, I believe, or at least we had the motivation to do our best. Um, Charlie and I and the rest of the Bada group and Cape Town Samizong had so many helpers to have as many diverse voices represented here today. And of course, we're working with the relative reality limitations of space and time. Also with the relative reality of our implicit bias, which we all carry and our human frailty and error. So we know that we've made mistakes. We own them. We know that there are people that we should have probably contacted, which we forgot or we didn't think to, or we didn't get to. And we beg your forgiveness, your grace, and your mercy. There is a tribute memory book in the front of the building. For those of you who don't get an opportunity today to share verbally, we invite you to please write your tributes in the book if you feel moved to. We also would love the people who are tuning in through the cyber world. It's a bit like a meta meditation. I was thinking about that this morning because we start in the shrine room and then we extend to the grounds and then we extend to the other centers in South Africa, in Grahamstown and Gauteng. And then the other centers in Africa, in Zimbabwe and the Democratic Re Republic of the Congo, which is the heart of Africa. And it is the lungs of the world really, but certainly Africa is where our second largest rainforest in the whole world is. And it's where the deepest and the biggest river is. So it's the heart, the lungs, and the blood. And then we extend it to everyone in the Zoom room. So we'd like you to prepare a tribute if you feel moved to. You can type it in um, a Word doc or in another place on your desktop if you want to. We're going to close the chat shortly. And when we open it at the end of the service today, We'll do a little tribute waterfall or cascade like the Victoria Falls. Mm -hmm. And we can all click send at the same time. And Richard, our amazing support, I think has also put some instructions in the chat so that we can also print those tributes out and we can add them in the book. Having said that, just a few points on housekeeping. Um, etiquette for those of you who are first time visitors, you are so welcome. When you come into the shrine room, we ask you to, if you are able to take off your shoes. And we ask you as well, that because the whole grounds have been blessed and consecrated by Akron Bajani, he's very strict about this, that there be absolutely no smoking or vaping anywhere on the ground. So as you uh, Charlie, have I left any housekeeping things out? <laughs> but you're learning, you're learning very quick. Yesterday we were, we Charlotte and I were talking and we were using some naughty words and Charlotte said, oh, does that mean this and this? And we'd be like, oh, he's quite bright, isn't he? <laughs> So with that, we are, you know, Rob has had so many wonderful friends over the years, and some of them will be able to uh, participate today. And the one glorious friend I want to say, um, also a friend to me, I feel, because I've been able to go into Guru Rinpoche case that I didn't even know existed, and met His Holiness the Jawa Karmapa when I wasn't even supposed to, um, and so many others of us. I'm looking at my roommate here, Nikki the crazy things we've done and it's all because of this friend of Rob's Erica van Grienen and um, Erica has prepared a tribute slash eulogy to Rob unfortunately 
the road from the other side of um, the Overberg, the other side of the mountain, on the Kaniberg, is so treacherous at the moment with the storms that neither she nor Tuki nor Brian um, were able to come today. But she has sent those precious words and she has got an emissary in the form of our Bardo babe, Roseanne. And Roseanne is going to come up here and read the eulogy. Thanks. For my face. So I've got the rather fantastic honor of reading Erica's words today. Um, so with lots of WhatsApps instructions in between <laughs> and <add-ons. laughs> Tashi Delic and greeting to all present or with us in cyberspace. Thank you for the privilege to say a few words about my mentor and buddy. Special greetings to Rob's family, to Bill and Mary. Tony, Grace, and my little sister, Margaret, who is a Dakini in an angelic human body. And of course, to Mother Betty. My journey with Rob was really a journey of his three books, Tranquil Mind, 1993, Diamond Mind, 1998, Living, Dreaming, Dying in 2002. These three books were published in many languages all over the world, and Shambhala and the U.S. currently holds the license. And then a P.S. Also, I did many pilgrimages with Rob, notably in 1997 to Tibet, where Margaret and I were roommates, and to India in 2002, with the joyful purpose of meeting the young Kamapa. After that, Rob encouraged me to lead pilgrimages and retreats with some of the greatest living teachers. His Holiness Kamapa, Taisitipa, Jalsa Purnpaseche, Tenzin Palma, Ringo Tulku, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Emma Ho. Although I worked with Rob largely through his written words and teachings, it was being with Rob that inspired me. His enticing smile, his razor sharp wit, his formidable intellect. He was at home with paupers and kings, with Buddhists and Christians, traditional healers, and those with no faith. And more formidable, the more the more formidable, the more Rob enjoyed the challenge. Swimming upstream, how boring to drift with the current. Raving the world to dream the impossible dream, following your bliss. What did I learn from Rob essentially? That life presents itself if we care to notice. Early on the morning of September the 30th, I noticed a delicate red poppy in my garden, the first to bloom since I've tried to cultivate poppies. This particular red poppy had little droplets of water that resembled teardrops. A wee bit later, the news came that Rob had passed away. So I bought a vase on Erica's behest of poppies for the front. The symbolism, symbolism of poppies resembles lotus flowers. From the dirt and mud grew a beautiful red poppy, wrote the surgeon poet in Flanders' fields of the World War. The Greek gods gave Demeter red poppies to help her sleep after her abduction of her daughter Persephone. Poppies sprang from her footsteps. The dangerous, alluring beauty of red poppy symbol is of resemblance, sleep, to peace, to death. Dear Rob, thank you for showing us a different way of being in the world. A journey, <coughs> the journey inward liberates so that our total way of being in the world undergoes a transformation to benefit all beings. Um, and so to remember our beloved Rob, Erica's device uh, acronym, Reach Out Beyond. It's to, and she's asked me to hand out little bookmarks to everybody here. Okay. If, you can, if someone can pass these along. Okay. 
So when you use this to remember Rob and what he stood for, thank you. Thank you. So my name's Charlie and I'm a member of the London Bada group as well as a close friend and student of Rob's. I've been asked to say something about the Buddhist view of death and dying a topic that Rob taught so extensively on. It's a huge subject, but essentially it boils down to the belief that Buddhists have that the mind stream of a person continues after the body dies and is then reincarnated into a new form. It's also believed that this continuation of the mind stream can be influenced and directed by certain meditation practices. In fact, Meditation in Buddhist circles is often simply, often simply referred to as practice. And I often think, practice for what? Practice for death. Every minute that Rob Nairn spent practicing his Buddhist meditations was a minute spent practicing for his death. And so Rob would have been prepared for this moment more than anybody, without doubt. His 50 years plus of practice would have undoubtedly planted the seeds for a successful death process. The vast majority of Rob's life was spent practicing Buddhism and his deep and personal connection to Akon Tulku Rinpoche will have assured him a first class ticket on his journey through the after death states. In fact, I once asked Rob, what would happen if as one was dying or had recently died, if one were able to think of Chenrezi, the Buddha of compassion, and I remember he paused for dramatic effect, as he loved to do. And he looked at me and said, if you were able to think of Chenrezi at the point of death, Chenrezi would appear, take you by the hand, and guide you to the pure realms. Now, I am almost certain that at the point of Rob's death, he will have thought of Akon Rinpoche. Who else? And so I have high hopes that Rob's faith in Akon Rinpoche will have taken him by the hand and guided him through the bardo. So what is this bardo journey exactly? It's funny, if I had been asked to do this at someone else's funeral, it would have been Rob that I would have emailed to ask. So I thought, well, who better to tell us about this journey through death than Rob himself? So I've taken the following from Rob's book, Living, Dreaming, Dying. Rob says, when we die, our stream of consciousness floats free from the body and roams the death bardos, which is the term given to the dreamlike hallucinatory experiences that the mind stream enters into once it's separated from the body at the point of death. In this stage, the bardo stages, the potential for liberation is present. Rob says the mind is nine times stronger in this state. And so if it is able to focus on a spiritual truth, it will immediately be drawn into it, experience it, and be liberated by it. All the practices to help the dead are based on the knowledge of the above and the understanding that although the dead have lost the power to communicate with us, we have by no means lost the power to communicate with them. For one thing, they can hear us. No matter where the mind is, it will hear the call and come. And so for the 49 day period of the bardo, the sangha will tell the dead person, you are dead. Everything you are experiencing are projections of your mind. Go towards the bright light, merge with the bright light. It is your enlightened mind. He goes on to say, apparently we don't even need to speak to them. Thinking of them is like calling their name. They will be drawn to whoever thinks of them. So now, why don't we put Rob's teachings into action? Think of him, look at his photo on the order of service or, or bring his image to your mind or look at the screen in front of us. And maybe in your mind, give him those three instructions as well. Rob, you're dead. Everything you're experiencing is a projection of mind. Go towards the bright light, merge with the bright light. It is your enlightened mind. Even though it's great to send these intentions to Rob, I'm pretty sure his favorable rebirth in a pure realm is already covered by the request for Poa 
made His Holiness Thai Sipupa, the prayers done by Lama Yeshe Rinpoche, and the 24-hour prayer vigil that was conducted next to his body soon after his death. His sister Margaret was responsible for making all this happen, and she did everything correctly, from leaving Rob's body untouched for four hours after death, to making sure that Wesley, the amazing carer who was with Rob as he died, touched the top of Rob's head to encourage his mind stream to exit through the crown. Is Wesley here? Where are you, Wesley? Yeah. So many of us Buddhists will have that written into our end of life, in our living will or end of life request or whatever, but it's so rare that it's ever actually done. For you to do that was so, such a brilliant gift you gave Rob. Thank you so, so much. Rob goes on to say, as well as this direct guidance, the other aspect that is said to be very beneficial to help the deceased is the generation of spiritual forces to help them. This can be done through offerings such as candles and incense. So for the whole 49 day period, of which we're now 42 days, there's now 42 days left, please do light candles for Rob, offer incense, especially on the weekly anniversary of his death, which is today. Is it said these are supposed to have even more power on this weekly anniversary? And now, before we go into the prayers, a short explanation of the prayers we're going to be doing, because not everyone here is into Buddhism. And um, in the, the to quote from a conversation we have from Margaret, we don't want to make it too Buddhist. -y. <laughs> but we will be doing prayers, but not too Buddhist. So the final way that we can really help the deceased is through prayers, just like the ones we're about to do. The meaning behind these prayers is deep and profound and way beyond my pay grade. But I can say this, the prayers we're about to do are the ones that I want done at my funeral. These are like the Buddhist prayers to be done when someone has died. So these are the correct things to do. These prayers, they're kind of like sat-nav directions for Robert's mind stream, for a favorable rebirth in the pure realms. They are the perfect prayers to say for Robert this time. And even if you don't understand them or know how to do the chant, just look at Rob's photo on the order of service or bring him into your mind and imagine sending him love and good wishes. Because as his teachings say, he is here now. He will hear us and he will feel your love. At the end, we'll chant the mantra of compassion on Mane Pemahong. And when we do that, definitely imagine that the sound of this mantra is like the sound of, uh, of love and direct that towards Rob. So we'll be doing the Dewa Chen prayers for those who, who have prayers and can hand them out for those who like them. So we'll do the Dewa Chen prayers. And then if you go after that to page 10, the taking appearances on to the path. And then at the end, we'll do the Dewa Chen. Oh, page eight. We're on the mom. But I think they're already on that page. Oh, it depends what book that you're on. But it's the short prayer, wishing prayer for rebirth in day one. <laughs> Okay, let's begin. Sunday, 
Thank you, Charlie. We say in Afrikaans, buy a donkey, which is not buy a donkey, but it sounds a bit like it. So, so we've come to the part of our service where we would like to invite the people who are here, who have prepared tributes to come up. And I'm going to ask Jenny, if you'll come up followed by Charlie, and then we have, oh, so happy, my twin, Pam Sheehan, all the way from Zimbabwe, who is going to, Pam and I share the same interesting condition, which I'm not going to reveal publicly, and we have the same birthday, which is why she's my twin, for those who need to know. Um, Pam will come up and share as well her tribute, and then we're going to have some red tributes, but I think let's do those three first. Everybody, it's wonderful to be here and such a privilege to be able to pay tribute to Rob. And I was thinking about the best way to start. And uh, I recall, um, hello there, Kate and Michelle, they're not paying attention. <laughs> hello, everyone. And that's exactly his point. So he would always start off especially in the shrine room, and he'd say, from a scale, Milena, from a scale from one to 10, how mindful are you right now? And then he'd make us gesture, so in his honor, how mindful, on a scale of one to 10, how mindful are we right now? So we can we can show our hands, let's, let's do it. I'm at about a seven, come on, look, a two, an eight, fantastic, a three. And, and this is the wonderful thing, because no matter, what level of mindfulness you were at. Jenny, there's so many people here. I just want to say hello. Um, he wouldn't be distracted. But what he would do is that no matter what level of mindfulness you had in the moment, he would say, we're all a mess. We're all in it together. And it's okay. And what a wonderful thing, feeling, isn't it? To really be a mess together. <laughs> that's exactly it <laughs> sure so um, it's just so wonderful because as um, Kate again she's not paying attention as she walked in because when I when I uh, as Kate the Buddha said to Kate used to work here and Kate was saying that a recommendation for to be able to work here was that you had to have a sense of humor how wonderful. And Rob had a very, very wicked sense of humor, which we all know. And it's just really lovely to bring that into the fore. I don't know what's happening there. There you can see we had a birthday with him and he really went for that cake, remember? <laughs> Margaret was very worried. We had several photos of what he was really going to be doing. We had a really, really great time. And if I think of Rob really, you know, the essence of him in the last you know, it's really, really moved by what you said. And I, I, I you know, um, I can't call you Scotty at this point because you said I'm not allowed to make fun much. But you used to call him Manir, which is really interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, we all love Rob so much. And the biggest thing, and I'm trying to think of what is the essence being a student for so long that really stuck with me. And for me, it was just being in such awe in such awe of his um, superpower. And his greatest superpower was being able to do this inquiry, which I like to call the subliminal inquiry. He never called it that, but I've just been thinking, what was his superpower? And he could do the subliminal inquiry. And Charlie, I think you know a lot about his subliminal stuff and what he used to do in his um, hypnopompic, I love that word, hypnopompic. In South Africa, it could mean a whole lot of different things. Hypnopompic, hypnopompic stage um, where he came to a lot of his own insights. And, um, and, and I'm sure all of you here have had that experience to be with Rob. And when we'd ask questions, 
And then he would engage us in a certain way with this kind of um, superpower of him, of his, to be able to do this inquiry, this this kind of um, subliminal inquiry. So he would listen to the question very intently, but he was he was also fantastic at grasping people on many different levels. You know, so he would listen to your question, he would listen to the sentiment, but also to what was unsaid and unspoken and those inner attitudes. So it was really amazing because I'm sure you've all had that experience with Rob. And I used to be fascinated because I never knew what was going to happen, what would come out of <laughs> these inquiries. Yeah. And it was fantastic. So um, for so many of his students, and I want to speak not just for myself, but for so many of us here or have been his students have asked these questions. If you can remember how you used to engage with Rob and how he would listen intently to you and he'd really connect with you. And then what that, what was really beautiful for me is the way that he used to give you time to think about, to reflect on your own thinking. You don't ever have time for that. To reflect on your own thinking, to kind of echo your words back at you. And then also to, to think about your question. What are your basic assumptions? What premises are you coming up with? What are your deeply held beliefs? He really liked to turn things upside down, which is really fantastic because, you know, he was into whatever you're doing, let's deconstruct that. And it was fantastic. And uh, so I'm in awe of him for, for the superpower that he has. So that's all very, a lot of serious stuff. And I'm sure that you've all had that immense opportunity to really gain some insight uh, from that. And I just remember that his intention every time was to give us the opportunity to reach our own conclusions, to develop insights into our own minds, right? Give us the opportunity to develop those insights. And more importantly, and you love this word, to recognize, to recognize the causes of our own suffering in our daily lives, for us to recognize the causes of our own suffering in our daily lives. And when we do that, we're actually able to start creating the causes of happiness so he was a wonderful wonderful teacher a master at that i mean that goes right to the heart of buddhism the cessation of of suffering okay so on a happier note i'm going to go off but just to say something on behalf of the inside group we have a wonderful inside group um for the last decade and um it was a privilege has been a privilege to grow old with rob and um, we've had him, you know, uh, we've had the blessing since he retired and came to stay at Helderberg with his wonderful sister, Margaret, to actually have access to him every second week. And, uh, you know, there was a, a two ingredients, Milena, you can, you, can, uh, you can verify this. Every second week, we would get together and there was two main characteristics. The main one was a sense of humor because he had such a sick, wicked sense of humor. So no matter what was going on with us, no matter what was going on with the world, he just he just brought such lightness to whatever was happening, you know. So it was really, really wonderful. We always had a good laugh together. And then secondly, and this is so powerful because as he grew older, he just grew, I think, more patient. Hey, Margaret, <laughs> much more patient. So he'd be very patient with us. And he would, we would end up every session and we'd say, thank you, Rob. You know, and good night. And we'd see you next week. He'd always give us homework. I was always trying to deny that. <laughs> give us homework. Good night. See you next week. Um, and we love you. And then he would end up saying, good night, all of you. Do the homework. And I love you all. So just to love and be loved by Rob is such a wonderful thing. And I think everyone here has had that experience. So I just want to quote my favorite uh, musician, George Benson, who said, the greatest gift, I'd love to be able to sing it for you. The greatest gift we can ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. So uh, uh, Margaret, as I end up, I just want to say that our, our inside group is going to carry on living up to Rob's legacy, his teachings, and his love. And um, Maureen has kind of said to me, you ain't going up without me coming up. I said, okay, one second is out. So we're just breaking your rule for one second. One second. She's just going to say something, something. Not even allowed to, to be more than one second. One second. Okay. <laughs>
Hi, I'm Maureen, for those of you who don't know. Um, we all know that Rob was very mischief mischievous, and so was I. I was his most mischievous student. And we used to play bridge together, but we couldn't cheat very much in bridge. But then one night we were playing Buddhist snakes and ladders. <laughs> and Rob cheated the whole way through because he wanted me to win the prize. And this is what I won. And then I have to put my glasses on to do this. And he wrote in it to my very dear friend who became in, enlightened ahead of us all. Wow, I am so lucky to know you. I love you. Well, that's my most favorite possession. <laughs> So my tribute to Rob. I owe this man everything. He was my Dumbledore. He was my first Buddhist teacher. He was my lucid dreaming teacher. He was the first one who suggested that I teach him to do. He taught me about conscious dying. He showed me the power of the hypnopompic state. And he introduced me to my guru, Lama Yeshe Rinpoche. I owe this man everything, and I love him dearly with my whole heart. It's sometimes said that the guru is even more important than the Buddha, because it's through the guru that we connect with the Buddha. So it got me thinking, well, then surely the person who connects us with the guru is of similar importance. So many of us, thousands of people, Rob was the one who connected us to the guru, to the Dharma. Rob was the gateway. He was the bridge. Rob was the path that led us to the Vajrayana path. I was 18 when I first met the Dharma, too young and immature to be able to relate to robed monks and enlightened Rinpoches. I needed someone like Rob. I needed someone who sounded like the university lecturers that I spent my days listening to, someone who I could have a conversation with, someone who embodied the teachings, but actually crucially wasn't enlightened. It was that balance of Rob's humanity and the flashes of awakened clarity that made him so good at what he did. Rob was the embodiment of the teachings in action still happening. He was so clearly still working through his own stuff, his own shadows, traumas and neuroses, but somehow that was more inspiring to me than if he had been this kind of fully enlightened guru, because it was relatable. It was inspirational. And through that inspiration, he hooked us, hooked us in and led us to those enlightened masters, to the profound path, to kindness and to joy. And for that, we owe him everything. Thank you, Dumbledore. <laughs> morning. Yeah, that's better. Morning, Margaret. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for the warm welcome as well. Um, it's, a, it's a real privilege for me to be here uh, representing Rob Trust of Zimbabwe and um, the Sangha of, um, of Zimbabwe, of Sami Lin uh, Zimbabwe. We are very, I feel very, very honored to be here today. And uh, Viv Kernahan asked if I could please read out the tribute to Rob um, from the Zimbabwe Sangha. And also um, from Zimbabwe today is my sister Brenda and Barbara. So we are very much with family and everybody today, all those miles away. All of us here have a special connection with Rob, as do the many others unable to be here to celebrate his life and everything he's done for us and been to us. For the Zimbabwe Sangha, he was extra special as he was born in the then Rhodesia. While he pursued his interest in Buddhism from the early 60s and taught courses in the region from 1965, it was only when he returned 
having completed the traditional four-year retreat at Sami Ling, that Buddhism in Africa was turbocharged. Rob's special skills as a lecturer and Dharma interpreter, making it accessible to Westerners, were a huge gift. Within a year, he had established a small but committed and surprised band in Zimbabwe, who were lucky enough to participate in Akon Rinpoche's first formal visit in 1994 to give refuge and empowerment. By the end of that year, with Rob's support, we had identified and started the purchase of the land that is now the Quendon Road Rock per center, and by 1996 had a usable, if not complete, shrine room. Then in 1998, we began building a larger temple nearby in Ernie's Lane, where Rob's building ambitions resulted in him constructing a very comfortable airy for himself. Many years later, when Drippen Rinpoche first visited Zimbabwe, he asked all of those he met how to come to Buddhism. The answer was always the same through Rob Nan. So impressed was he that he wanted to go and visit Rob to thank him, not realizing that Cape Town was more than a day trip away. But he did phone Rob to acknowledge the breadth of his work. Rob also fully supported Akron Rinpoche's desire to indigenize Buddhism in Africa and to link up with local traditional spirit leaders. This resulted in several of them taking refuge with the various lamas who visited us over the years, cementing the link between Buddhism and local spiritual leadership. Rob also had his book, Tranquil Mind, translated into Shona, the first book on Buddhist teachings in the African language. This was launched in Chikukwa in Chamani Mani, which in 2018 was the site of a visit by Drupan Rinpoche and Lama Katten, where a cultural exchange was held to share Tibetan cultural beliefs with those of the Shona people. The simple and special truth is that without Rob's leadership, his pioneering spirit, and his total devotion to Akka Rinpoche, and to sharing the Buddhist teachings, none of the Southern African Buddhist centers would be here. The region would still fall under the old Tibetan view of our barbaric country, a place where the Buddhist teachings cannot be found, a fact that Akron Rinpoche himself acknowledged when he said, without Rob, there would be no Buddhism in Africa. This is the depth of what we our beloved Rob. May he swiftly arrive in Devachin. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here together with all of you. Um, I'm here to read the contribution by Trish Swift, who knew Rob very well. Um, and she says, good afternoon, everyone. I feel very heart sore not to be joining others in celebrating and giving thanks for Rob's life. We were friends for 53 years. A few years ago, Drupan Rinpoche asked us in Zimbabwe to write an account of Akron Rinpoche's activity in this country. And since Rob was the key figure in implementing Rob's work, uh, implementing Rinpoche's work, I asked if I could interview him about his life and felt that a few aspects that he related to me might be of interest to this gathering. In 1965, at the age of 25, Rob traveled east to Sri Lanka and then India 
where he spent five months learning about the School of Wisdom at the Theosophical Society headquarters. After that, he went to visit the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala. <clears throat> at the end of the interview, when Rob was signing the visitor's book, the Dalai Lama said, go back to, to Africa and feed the poor. And Rob replied, well, there isn't in, uh, in Rhodesia, it was then. And the Dalai Lama retorted, you know that's not what I meant, and he hit Rob over the head. <laughs> and Rob felt that he had received a thorough blessing and was called to spread the Dharma in Africa. Back in Rhodesia, Rob was working as a magistrate and had been deployed to various centers in the country. At the same time, he managed to study for a law degree with the University of Rhodesia. The degree was awarded in 1968, and Rob then got a Commonwealth scholarship to study for a postgrad certificate in criminology and Scottish criminal law at Edinburgh University. So he then went to Scotland. Upon completion of this course, he decided to visit Sammy Ling. He took a bus from Edinburgh to Langham and thought he'd hitched from there. Unfortunately, there were no lifts and he ended up walking for five to six hours with a heavy suitcase. At that time, Akan Rinpoche was at Sami Ling and Chodjam Trumpa Rinpoche was based at Garwald. So Rob made his first connection with Akan Rinpoche at that time. Upon his return to Rhodesia, he joined the law department at the University of Rhodesia as a lecturer spe specializing in criminology. His courses were very popular and he made lasting friendships with several of his students. And during this period, Rob invited Dina Day to Salisbury, now Harare, to lead a 10-day Vipassana retreat within the Theravadan tradition. While in UK, Rob had done a month retreat in the center established by a Thai monk, Cha Kun Dharavamsa, where Dina Day was an assistant to Dharavamsa. So that is how Rob met Dina. Dina encouraged uh, Rob to continue teaching meditation himself. But Rob's stay in Rhodesia came to an end when called up to the Rhodesian army towards the end of the 70s. And as he did not wish to serve in Smith's army, he re relocated to Cape Town, where he was offered a senior lecturer post at UCT. <laughs> he was subsequently appointed Professor of Criminology and Director of the Institute of Criminology. Now, this is an interesting thing. The Institute was committed to extensive research which involved going to the prisons and studying regulations. Rob came across a UN international document on the minim minimum rights for prisoners. This document called for reasonable access to reading materials for all prisoners. And Rob had discovered that the Cape prisons that in those Cape prisons, prisoners were not allowed any access to reading materials. So he wrote an article about this in the National Law Journal. The United States Secretary of State for Africa happened to read it and summoned the SA ambassador in New York to account for this discrepancy. The ambassador sent a rocket to the South African Ministry of Justice and a major international furore developed and Rob was in big trouble. And a friend in the Ministry of Justice tipped him off that the preferred course of action was deportation. In the event, the decision was made to permanently deny Rob access to any government department or prison, which meant that their research would be severely curtailed. He then decided to move to New Bethesda, where he had bought a property, and there the new Bethesda Centre was established, and the first two residents to join Rob were Jenny Desfontaine and Caroline Berry. Now, the three were discussing the possibility of inviting Akron Rinpoche one afternoon when Jenny immediately ran out to use the faulty phone box, which did free international calls. <laughs> she phoned Sammy Ling and invited Rinpoche, who immediately agreed to come. And when he arrived, he asked about the whereabouts of this Bodhisattva phone booth <laughs> so that he could phone Yang Chen, his wife, to tell her that he had arrived safely. During his second visit to New Bethesda, he 
that formed the basis for Taming the Tiger. Rob recorded all the exercises and sent them to Rinpoche, who passed them on to Edie Irwin and Clive Holmes to put them together into a book. There is a great deal more to say about Rob, but not enough time. And she actually ended with the same quote that Viv referred to. Rinpoche had said, without Rob, there would be no Dharma in Africa. And interesting that the Dalai Lama had seen Rob's potential for spreading the Dharma and Akron Rinpoche confirmed it. Wow, thank you so much. So nice to have Zimbabwe in the house. Yeah, so we've got a oh, oh. we've got a few more um tributes from friends. Um I just need to get myself organized here because it requires me playing voice note, which is going to be uh oh. Sound okay. Dan, did you send it from Esme's phone or did you send it from your phone? You sent it from your phone, right? Okay, got it. Okay, we're good to go. So um we also have a quote from Francis Chungu. Brother, I hope I'm pronouncing your surname correctly and forgive me if I'm not. It's my dream to come and visit you at the Samuelin Democratic Republic of Congo. It really is a, such a strong wish. So I hope that through the blessing of Rob and Akram Chair that wish will come true, but less about me and more about the tribute. The quote here is, my first impression when I met Rob Nain for the first time in Harare in 2004 and received his teaching was the same impression that my Congolese friends had when they met Rob Nain in 2010 and thereafter. Rob Nain exudes a peace that is difficult to explain. This is why he is for us an inexhaustible source of African Dharma. And then we have a tribute from Beryl, Beryl Schutten who I think is watching on Zoom. Hello, Beryl, love you. <laughs> um, Beryl and Isma are both in Cape Town, but they are watching us from the comfort of their home. And um, I'll read Beryl, Beryl's tribute first. What could I possibly add to the waterfall of tributes already paid? Your warmth, your worth, your courage, your authenticity in recognizing that which may have fallen short within. I wanted so much to tell you of your preciousness in my life, to tell you how you touched our lives so deeply and profoundly, to thank you for your compassionate heart so many times. But you would just smile and say thank you. You never really believed it. Maybe now, beloved Rob, wherever you may be, maybe now as you see or feel the outpouring of love and sorrow and gratitude, you can accept your great worth. So to you, my very first teacher, you who introduced me to everything that is meaningful in life and in living, who presented the Buddha Dharma in a way that was dynamic, hugely challenging, yet fun and joyous. Now I say goodbye. Nothing will more. My words are threadbare. They just can't say it, your devoted student, Beryl. And then I have a voice note from Esme. It's amazing because it was recorded yesterday, thanks to Zan, but the tribute was written, when was Rob 47? 19 something. Okay, I'm gonna try and make this work. Hey, Robert. On his 70th birthday, 20th of August, 2000. Okay, Charlie's signaling to me it's the other one, so bear with. What would I do without you, Charlie? <laughs> this 
was sent to Robert at Sammy Ling before he started his long retreat, the 21st of August, 1986. Robert's 47 today, just three years short of 50. In spite of his advancing years, he still looks pretty nifty. He's hard at it, our Robert is, before the sun stops shining. That he is not enlightened yet is indeed most surprising. It's chanting here, puja there, and hours of morning mantra. It's calluses and painful knees and initiates a tantra. Robert's 47 today, a time for great rejoicing. But there's a shadow on his brow, and there's a fear he's voicing. Yes, I'm 47 today, and the years seem to be flying. With enlightenment, my goal is gold. Who needs old age, sickness, and dying? <laughs> For life is full of pain and sorrow. Here today and gone tomorrow. So before it's ashes to ashes and dust to dust, enlightenment or bust. <laughs> That's our wonderful resident poets. We have a few actually in the Sangha. Um, I think we have one more, Charlie. We have a late uh, tribute that we received this morning. Well, we just, I haven't read it yet, so um, surprise. It's from Andrew Lang, and it says, Rob joined an infant law school part of London University in Salisbury in March 1966 as a first-year law student. The school was one year old, and I joined it as an infant law teacher, already having been appointed to a position as a magistrate in the excellent Rhodesian service. While yet only 21, Rob showed in his law classes for the first for the next three years that he brought not just clear thinking to his study, but a remarkable calmness of character. And to transmit that very calmness and an almost precious wisdom to the rest of his classes and the law school. Those early days of the law school were experiencing the anxiety and fear that beset the very country itself immediately following the days of 1965 and UDI. Rob early came into the life of, came into the life of my family as a much liked and valued babysitter to my then three children. He was after graduation and came back from his postgraduate qualification at London University to strengthen our still young law school. It was to our acute dismay to see him thereafter go to the law faculty of UCT. And in the following years, I was to see Rob only on infre infrequent occasions. These occasions were, because of his very special character, always calculated to bring word of him achieving great things, of his uplifting the desperate society of New Bethesda to the new life of me of his years of study at Lockerbie, of his prominence as a religious teacher, coming to the Grahamstown Festival to lecture on Buddhism to an enthusiastic following. How very good a man I am so grateful to have known. Thank you, Andrew. Well, we now have the dedications from various Dharma teachers and Buddhist teachers. And the first one comes from Lama Yeshe Rinpoche. This is taken from a, um, a talk that he gave just recently, that he asked to use this as the transcript. Rob was the first person to bring Tibetan Buddhism to South Africa and the surrounding areas, and he has done a great job. I've known him so many years, and of course, my brother, Akon Rinpoche and Rob, were the very closest and they know each other very well. So I think if one person can do such a good job as Rob did, I think that's perfect. We should really follow Rob's path. He gave his whole life to Dharma. 
going around teaching and founding the Mindfulness Association. Without Rob, there would be no mindfulness. His whole life has been going around the world, running courses and propagating Buddha's teachings. He has done more than anyone can ever do. Now, of course, we're very sorry that he's passed away, but you can't remain here forever. Even the Buddha had to pass away. So it was his time to leave this world. And of course, we should all be so grateful to his sister, Margaret. She really did give him the best, best care. He had all these people 24 hours a day looking after him. I think in many ways, Rob was so fortunate. I think we should remember his legacy and we should make sure that we do not easily give up our Dharma centers in South Africa or Zimbabwe or wherever it is, because Dharma is the only thing that can truly help human beings. There's another tribute from Lama Zangma from the London Center. Rob has had a huge impact on the Dharma in Africa. Due to his dedication and devotion to Akon Rinpoche, countless people have met the teachings and benefited from the practice of meditation and mindfulness. I pray that Rob will meet Rinpoche again soon. We, Roseanne, shared a message uh, Ringo Toku sent her. Dear Roseanne, thank you for your sad information. I am doing prayers for Rob. I am sure he will be well. I would like to send my condolences to his friends and students and family members. My love and prayers, Ringo Toku. Uh, Lama Zangma, Rob has had a huge impact on the Dharma. Oh, have you read it already? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, Lama Zangma. Uh, Tupton. I first got to know Rob when we would travel together with Akka Rinpoche on his visits to South Africa and Zimbabwe. I could see his devotion and incredible diligence in fulfilling his teacher's wishes. The more impossible the task set by Rinpoche, the more eagerly to the challenge. With such Rob, but also feel inspired by his rich and meaningful life, and we can see the fruits of his work all around us. And we've also got a tribute from Chudin. It is with sadness and gratitude that I reflect on the passing of my dear friend, colleague, and teacher, Rob Nain. We go back so I remember first hearing him talk at the Theosophical Society in Cape Town in the mid-80s. It was a talk that changed the course of my life. He spoke with such eloquence and clarity about the power of meditation. After that talk, my law studies took a back seat and my life became devoted to the path of Dharma and meditation. Soon after that talk, I remember hitchhiking to New Bethesda in the Karoo, where Robert set up a Buddhist retreat center. When we arrived, we were met Addictions and mental health issues. I remember thinking, where have I landed up? Rob was not there then, but a day or so later he arrived. This is something that first touched me about Rob, how he would take on people as students that society had rejected, and how he gradually nurtured them with his kindness and wisdom. This was a great quality of his teacher, Akarambache. There are many wonderful memories of time spent with Rob, life-changing retreats, amazing personal interviews, and simply spending time with him. I remember his great energy and vision when we first set up the Mindfulness Association in Scotland and the MSc with Aberdeen University. He was a unique and wonderful being, and he will be very sorely missed. And this one from Ken Holmes, the Dharma teacher. Despite crossing paths with Rob often over the past 40 or more years, we actually spent quite little time together. I mainly got to know his work through his students that I met. Some said they literally owed their lives to Rob Nair, and many others have had their lives definitely changed for the better. Rob encouraged me to come and teach regularly in Southern Africa and fix that up with great kindness. In Samaling, I witnessed again and again 
the way Akon Rinpoche trusted him and entrusted him with great tasks. All of this has led me to develop a sincere personal respect for Rob. And I knew I had personally something to learn from his methods and approach as one only can from a peer teacher with a different style. He's gone now, but he's left living treasures in so many people. May he embody the dying teachings that he gave so kindly to so many. And from Ken Holmes' brother, Clive Holmes, another Dharma teacher. My earliest recollection of Rob Nairn was from the very early days at Samalin, where he used to help me collate the prayers I was printing. He always demonstrated kindness and deep insight into the teachings, especially about death and dying. <laughs> I'm missing the page. <laughs> His time studying with Krishna Mercy showed in everything he did. <laughs> We're missing that last line, but it was about Krishna Mercy and the fact that it showed up in everything that Rob did. Um, and we have one more from Heather Regan Addis. I know Rob to be kind, funny, unpredictable and the most intelligent and articulate speaker I have ever heard. I had the great good fortune to stay with Rob and his sister at their home near Cape Town in South Africa for a week in August. His last teaching to me was his accepting attitude of what was happening in those last days and the grace and humor with which he allowed those around him to care for him. This eases my heart. I feel so grateful that within the Mindfulness Association, we get to continue his legacy of teachings on mindfulness, compassion, and insight. My dear friend, I hope that your being is held in peace and love always. People in the Zoom room, now is the time for you to write your tributes. If you would like to add any tributes that we will print out and collate, and add into the tribute book. I think the chat is open now. And don't click send yet. Just type it up. This is the Afrikaans school teacher coming out in me. You know, I used to be a school teacher, Margaret. Yes, before I became a psychologist. That's why I'm so strict. Type, don't click send yet. And while the people around the world are doing that, we just think of Rob, as Charlie said so beautifully early, earlier, you can even look at his picture and just feel the gratitude and warmth and love for our friend and our teacher in our hearts and just radiate it out to him. Jenny was quite right. I used to always call Rob Munir. Because when I started living here and he was here in residence, the, it's a kind of a respect thing in Afrikaans, right? We don't call people by their first names. It's just a weird English thing. We don't do that. So we still call people women Tani in the fro in Munir in the Yifra. But he wasn't my uncle, so I couldn't call him Wim. So the, the other thing was to call him Sir. So I used to call him Sir in Afrikaans, which is Manier, and he would call me Skati. Okay. And with that, you may now click send. If you haven't finished typing, don't panic. There will still be time. Click send. Oh, look at that beautiful tribute waterfall.
Um, yeah, just what, what a day, just a huge thank you to everybody who came to, to share with us and may we all just take forward with us our wonderful memories of Rob and please come and share some tea and snacks with us afterwards and from the family, thank you for coming, everybody. And Charlie and Azelle, you are incredible, both of you. Thank you. Thank you for all that you've done. <laughs> thank you so much. So as Margaret says, for those of us who are here, there will be some refreshments. Sorry for you aren't here. You have to figure your own out. Uh -oh. Um, and we've got one more special ditty to play you before we do wish we do the dedication. Yeah. Robert, on his 70th birthday, 20th of August, 2009. Well, dear old friend, the time is near to celebrate another year. Gone, gone, oh yes, gone, gone beyond. The message clear on just how fond we are and how we try to cling to even woes life's borders bring. Or creeping softly ever near is that last, final, fateful year when all you hold so safe and dear will pass away and disappear. But have no fear, for blessed are you with clearest mind and knowledge true. My birthday wish is that that is when you will pass straight into David Chen. The night. <laughs> Thank you.